in the secret, you know, the, the movie and the book. I was the only one that was talking about the, the environmental luck, how feng shui and dowsing and space clearing is really affecting um, how you feel in your space. A lot of people are sometimes, they have all these great changes they're making, right? Uh, if it's through healing, if it's through changing their mindset, if it's through spiritual work, they literally sometimes cannot integrate it or they cannot activate it or they cannot implement it because their home is is not aligned with what they really want. Welcome to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. Remember to subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Today, we're thrilled to have renowned feng shui master Dame Marie Diamond with us. For more than 30 years, Marie's been transforming lives as a global best-selling author and star of the worldwide phenomenon, The Secret. Marie's expertise blends ancient feng shui methods and modern day neuroscience to help people manifest. Her clientele includes celebrities in film, music, global leadership, and even royal palaces. During our conversation, we touch on Marie's unique approach and how it can help you live an abundant, joyful life of purpose. You're gonna to wanna to take notes on this one, so let's go. Marie, what a delight to have you with us today. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much, Julie, for having me, and I'm excited to be here. Well, wonderful. Let's just get right into it. What's feng shui? <laughs> well, feng shui, first of all, is um, an energy system from China that is around for about 3,000 years. And literally, it means wind and water, and it's all about energy flow. And you can kind of compare it with like when we look at acupuncture or Tai Chi or Qigong, it works with the energy of the body, but this is working with the energy of your home. So it is really an art of placing the furnishing, uh, placing the images, the paintings, but also adding the colors um, into your home so you'll feel at peace and harmony, but also start attracting good fortune and success, money and relationships. I've used it for probably 25 years. And oh. as a medical intuitive and psychic medium, I can see the energy flow in my mind's eye in the home. So yeah, I can see what's happening and see the energy flowing down the street for abundance and coming in the front door and things like that. So I've been so excited to talk to you because I know this stuff works. I know it firsthand from my own home. So I got lots of questions for you, girl, to, to okay. talk about all of this. How does a person's energy affect what they experience in life? Do we attract things based on our own personal energy? Well, you know, um, what my grandmaster in Feng Shui always told, there were three ways that we work with energy. And the first one is what we would call the spiritual luck, the spiritual aspect. And that is your soul coming into your body with a, I would say, a basic package of talents, of a purpose that you have in life and we we align with that or we do not you know sometimes we we do not uh, connect with it and so but that's apparently like 33 percent of how you work with energy and so it can change you know if you for example change living in a certain place like i come from living in belgium to living in los angeles my spiritual luck will change because there's a different surrounding uh, where i am and the second part is what we do with that spiritual uh, basic package as a human being. So what is the mindset that we have? What is our behavior? What are the actions we take? We call that the human aspect of working with your energy. And the third aspect, what is most missed out, is the environment, is the energy for where you live, sleep, and work. So your home and where you work. And that is affecting also the earth energy and your connection to manifest. And that's for most people, the missing link of energy day. They focus on their mindset and focus on their energy of their body, of their soul and spiritually, the connections they have with God, but then they forget to have also a connection with, with the place where they live. Well, that goes along, along the lines of, I do a lot of work with clients. I'm a medical intuitive and, and energy healer, and I'm like a human MRI, Marie, and there are many times when a client will come to me and they've been to many doctors and same 
diagnoses, you know, same treatment modalities, still have the symptoms. And I'll see that they have, their bodies are full of mold. And then I'll scan their house. And I, again, like a human MRI, I can see in the walls, I can see in my mind's eye where the mold is. And I'll say, you've got a mold problem. So that goes back to what you're talking about with the environment, not only affecting our sense of abundance and all of those other goodies, but also our health. Have you found well, that to be the same? Yes, for sure. You know, feng shui is first of all used for health and well-being, not for money or relationships. So they would look at where is the best location to build a house. For example, you want to avoid the cold northern winds and have the warmer southern and western winds in the northern hemisphere. But also, you know, I'm also a dowsing master. So I also check in and I have the, like you, I am an intuitive. I can see in my, in my mind's eye what is going on. And I see sometimes underground water or, you know, I see people's aura field. And I'm like, yeah, there's mold. I mean, I can do all the feng shui of the world. But if there's mold, I cannot change that because you have to really look into that. But it also, I can see the electromagnetic fields that are, uh, you know, disturbing the health. But it's always more than the health, because if the health is not okay, they don't sleep well, it will affect their relationships, it will affect their productivity and their business. Right. And there are certain energy lines in somebody's home, correct? Talk to us yeah. about, like, I'm really familiar with the financial lines because I've had experience with that as a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> you know, it's like, is it up? Is it down? What's going on? If I'm seeing that the energy flow of money is interrupted, then we're tweaking things in the business. Yes. So ex please explain to everybody how that works. Well, if we look at feng shui perspective, then we know that everything is connected with the wind vibration, so the flow of energy. And so based on the birthday, you actually have your own wind direction that is always strong. It's like your energy line for you. For example, mine is southwest, so I need to always take care of the southwest of my house. So the southwest of my full floor plan or the southwest of every corner. So in the southwest stands for me, but for you can be east or north, whatever that is. Um, I need to make sure it's decluttered. I need to make sure it's aligned. So I have, for example, my books there. I have my awards there. I have my major bank statements. My uh, contracts are always in the southwest because that is where the line of energy comes in. And people can find that out by, first of all, checking in with the book Feng Shui Your Life that just came out through Hay House. But also they can go to the Free Mary Diamond app. And so as they go into the app, they actually have to put in their birth gender and their birth date because it creates an energetic profile. And then based on that, you will receive your directions that are good for success and money, health, relationship, and wisdom. And then you get a diamond compass. And the diamond compass literally looks like this. So it's like you will get directions that are showing up and there are other directions that are empty. So especially the one with success is where your energy line for the rest of your life. It's always the same. For me, it's Southwest. For you, it's something else. It always has to be strong. So whatever you have placed there is creating one third of the results of your vibration. So that's on a feng shui perspective. Now, from a perspective of the magnetic field, if people have a house with a lot of underground water and they have a, a you know, that underground water hitting their front door, they are literally, um, you know, losing money because it's like underground water is, is always a symbol of money in feng shui. It's actually, it kind of drains their front door and it drains their money. So we have simple, um, what we call acupuncture sticks that we're placing in the house to totally harmonize that. And then people see like within a few days that the money has to turn around. But it can also be images around you because, you know, everything around you is subconsciously affecting you. Like you have this beautiful image around you from a mountain, from a castle. So that's actually very abundant. Like you're like the queen of that castle. So symbolically, right, you're like, I'm visiting this castle, right? Yeah. But you also have a mountain behind you. So you have a mountain behind you. It gives you that support, a financial support. You will see a lot of the wealthy places in the world have always mountains um, because when there's mountains there, you will have long-term money 
in your neighbor, in your life. Interesting. I never thought of that. I love that. I'm the queen of my castle. <laughs> I was like, you know, in a fairy tale. Maybe I could just imagine walking into that. Oh, I love that. That's a riot. Um, well, yeah, you look at Switzerland and you look at a lot of the other places in the world where people have chalets or or even here in America, certainly Vail, Aspen, you know, the yeah. things in but oh, also wow. like Hong Kong, you know, there's water and there's mountains like Monaco. I lived for, you know, 10 years in Monaco area. So there's mountains, there's water here in Malibu, you know, in and um, in California, there's mountains and there's water. If there just would be water, it would not be enough. The mountains always keep the water, keep the money. Yeah. So a couple of stories of things that have happened in my home that I've experienced myself. First of all, I have beveled glass, I've leaded glass French doors on the front of our home. And then the whole back of the house is all glass, like floor to ceiling, 40 feet of glass. And so I was told that the money comes in and that's what I see as it comes down somebody's street and comes into their front door, but it's flying out the back of my house because it's all glass. And so yeah. what, what I was told by a feng shui gal with whom I've used for years was to put two little mirrors, one kind of on the baseboard and one on the French door heading out to the back of the house so that the money is reflected back in and it doesn't flow out the back. It was almost immediate the difference that I noticed. That was number one. Number two, after my parents had died, Marie, I brought my mother's crystal and china home and I put them in a cabinet on one side of the fireplace. Well, it was right in the middle of the financial line. And I was noticing something happening there that didn't look good. And I called my feng shui gal and I said, what the heck's going on? And she said, well, have you done anything differently there? And I said, yeah, I put my mother's stuff in there. And she said, well, how did your mother feel about money? I said, yeah. there was never enough. And she said, get it out of there. And I said, well, what am I going to do with it? I want to use it and I want to keep it. She said, put it, put it down on the lower level, get it off of your financial line. And I did. And Marie instantly the financial line energy went back to normal. That was so amazing to me at how it instantly changed. Yeah, it's it works very fast. It's very interesting. I always say to people, between nine hours and nine weeks. Yeah, so depending on how sensitive people are, it will go faster. Right? You don't have to believe in it. It's not about belief. It's about how fast you react to energy. Right. So for you, as you're super sensitive to energy, you will immediately have the shift or even just a shift in your mindset sometimes. Right. So, but most people within nine weeks, they see a change. And so if people even, you know, we look also at when people work at their office, like the directions, there are literally 360 degrees and, and a compass. And depending on your birthday, there will be certain degrees that are strong. And then even in these degrees like Southwest, there's specific degrees that even that I can say, put your desk this degree. And it's like, ultimately, what they see is that within a few months, they double their income. It's just really very interesting how the winds can really change, you know, the frequencies, of course, that you're tapping into. But we have to be very aware of what we place around us because subconsciously, it is affecting us. It's like through the mirror neurons of our brain, Whatever is around us is affecting ourself. And so, of course, what you place there with your, your, your energy of the mother, you know, and how she was connecting in with money will affect you because it's like all your ancestral programs will start stirring up because you have that image out there from your, um, you know, your ancestors. So we need to be careful about that. Is it that the energy was in her china and crystal or was it my interpretation of how she felt about money because i didn't think well, about it when i put it there i just happened to scan the financial line and i was like holy schmoly something's up here yeah well i think both to be honest i think you know first of all you know everything you have around us absorbs our vibration right and especially ceramics because ceramics and crystals are very good in absorbing energy 
And so we know that just from the crystals itself, like beautiful gemstones. So even if things are made with crystal or ceramic, they are great absorbers. So whatever her mindset was, and perhaps her conversations were in the dining room or in a place where she had that china, was just absorbing. And that's the first thing. But also the second part is that by having it there, especially in your financial connection, is that for you, it, 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 I would say brought forward your ancestral programs, yeah? Mm-hmm. That you just like, oh, because you're, you're trained somehow by your mother about money, right? So um, I had that once I put this um, image of my mother out in, um, in my uh, relationship direction, right? Um, like my mother and me, right? Because I love my mother, she passed on. So I put it there and suddenly I start talking about my mother. Like I said literally to my students, like you cannot have everything. You cannot have a, a great, good looking husband and all the money of the world. And I was like, where's that coming from? You know, and I was like, oh my God. It's like I put the, in my picture of my mother, I put her now in my wisdom and inspirational connection because she gave me inspiration and she gave me a lot of wisdom, but I never put her in my relationship direction anymore because somehow that was like my old program. That was words that my mother always said, yeah? So, and I was like, no, I can have it all. I can have a good looking husband. We're 33 years together and I can have all the money of the world. So sometimes it's just like, it's there and it brings something up in us. Well, in your mother living in Belgium, I'm, I think there's probably a pretty good chance she was there during World War II and Correct. probably yes. experienced some horrific things or at least scary things. I'm sure she went to a bomb shelter probably more than once in her I, life. I don't, I don't think that because, um, you know, she was in a very safe area of uh, the, the, with farms. But, uh, you know, they had to shelter uh, German soldiers in their farms. So... I mean, and they had refugees that they were, you know, trying to save. So there was a lot of things. Of course, everybody at the time had some experiences. But I think it was really interesting um, that we are just always so connected. I always say, like, your home is subconsciously reflecting onto you all the time. And that's why I sometimes call it, it's like your three-dimensional vision board, right? So it can support you. It can also block you. How does the energy work outside of the home? I am very into gardens and have a lot of gardens in our, we have a very big lot and it kind of looks like a botanical garden. And if there's a plant or a bush or a tree or something that's suffering or that's dying, it's like, I got to get it switched. I got to get it healed. I, it's There's definitely something there. Am I, what am I picking up on with that? Well, you know, we also uh, have what they call landscape feng shui. So it means that your home is not just a physical structure, right? It's like our body. We we have our physical body, but we have an aura field. And so exactly our home is also surrounded by an aura field. And we always say within like uh, 10 feet, that's like three meters, uh, it's actually the same as our etheric body. When we look at like 30 feet, it's like that's 10 meters. It's like our emotional body. And another 30 feet, that's again uh, 10 meters, is like our mental body. Yeah. So that whatever is happening around us is physically affecting our body all the time. So I just moved to LA and beautiful home in Bel Air, but the garden was not taken care of. And so I, I've been tapping into the garden like, you know, uh, to the, the consciousness of the garden because everything is a living being and like what do I need to do and so we had to like cut a few trees for the sunlight you know I was a whole preparation for me to be in connection with that tree to you know to explain to the tree you know I need to let you go um, you know we'll take care of, of the roots like things like this I'm in constant conversation always with things around us and so, and I know the garden starts feeling already happier because now, you know, we're putting new grass and, you know, putting new plants. And so you have to understand there is something called landscape feng shui. So based again on the uh, directions, there are certain plants that you can put in there, certain forms, certain, um, I would say, uh, lights or even elements like fire or water. You know, even 
people put sometimes a jacuzzi or a pool really in an area that can really harm not just the landscape, but can harm the people that live in the house. So for us, whatever is with water features is very crucial in the landscape. Fascinating. All right. So so you and I are tree huggers, I guess, because we talk to the plants. Yes, but... we are. <laughs> yeah, but we are. <laughs> okay. All right. So that's just bringing up a whole bunch more questions for me. I have talked to other feng shui people, obviously feng shui consultants, and they use some kind of a grid that goes on the home. And it seems to be the same for everybody. What I keep hearing you say is that it's different for everybody based on your birth date. And that's what your app really helps you determine. What's Can you talk about that a little bit? What's yeah. the difference between those? Is one like ancient Chinese and another one's less ancient Chinese or what's what's the what's the difference? Yeah. Well, I'm first of all a classically feng shui trained feng shui master. So I got into uh, trained by a grandmaster in Malaysia who was Chinese. So we really use a lot of what I would say schools and schools are like thought forms and thought processes. And one of them is landscape. The other is the water dragon formula is all about water. It's your compass that's connected with your personal feng shui. It's a time feng shui. It's called flying stars. And there's so many other processes, uh, but they are the major ones. What you're talking about, the Bhagawa or the mapping, is something that was is actually not considered uh, ancient feng shui. Um, it is actually set up in the early 80s by a, a Chinese um I would say, um, I, I wouldn't call him a feng shui master, but you know, he was considered later on a feng shui master, but I would say somebody that tried to help to bring feng shui to the America and set it up in such a way that uh, it was more general, yeah? And so it actually always says the front door is a career and your relationship is back to the left, but that's actually not true because your front door cannot be the north, it can be the south, it can be the east. So we focus exactly on the compass. And based on the compass of action, when you are you moved into the house, and then of course the birthdays of the people in the house, the major breadwinners, um, and even the decorations that or the renovations you have done can really shift the whole um, basic floor plan energy. And so we have cycles of 20 years and every 20 years there's new floor plans that are uh, that we need to tap into. And your your career energy cannot be at your front door, can be all the way to the left, can be in, in the south. It depends on when you moved in and when um, you, you know, set up the whole building. And so it, it's very more advanced. So the Bagua mapping works sometimes very well for, especially for houses that have cardinal directions, north, south, east, or west. People have good reactions, but I have so many times people say like, it started working and then it stopped because if they have uh, directions that are southwest, southeast, northeast, northwest, they that mapping definitely will not work. Mm. And so it is just like, they made it easily. And, you know, as the first feng shui books in um, America came out with the mapping, a lot of people think that is really feng shui, but this is like, you know, in China and the Chinese feng shui master don't really consider that real feng shui. Well, and I know in Asia that people rely on experts like you to position their homes, position their sky rise buildings, position Correct. other things. And they wouldn't even think about building a building until they consult with a feng shui master. That's correct. So in Hong Kong, actually, you cannot even have a permit uh, to to build a sky rise if you have not the consent of a feng shui master how to place it. You know, and I know I'm a guest in the culture, um, but I'm also, you know, well trained. And I was actually the only, uh, at that time, the only European feng shui master for a long time because I had trained but I, the moment I studied that, it was just like, I understood it completely. It was like, uh, literally, I was studying at the end of the day. I was teaching already the other students how to do it. It was just like something so natural for me. 
because on top of it, like you, you, I could see the energy. Like I could see when I change the desk or I put something else, I see immediately the chakras change of the people looking at it. I see the aura field change. So that has been an extra gift for me mm -hmm. to be that intuitive. Um, but I really base a practical feng shui and I use the low palm, which is very special, a tool. And we use also the dowsing rods to make sure that if I place your bed somewhere, that you're not sleeping on underground water. Because if I would, then I would make you sick. So a lot of people think it's it's a simple thing, but it's really, it, it is quite complex. But that's why the book Feng Shui Your Life, I create a beginner's guide. Uh, for that, and it's on Amazon and good bookstores. So they have like me with them at the beginning, but focusing on the personal feng shui, but focusing on your birthday, because that alone sh shifts things very fast. And don't you have a TV show coming out? Yeah, it's a TV that? show coming out. Yeah. Yes, uh, called Feng Shui Your Life. And so that's going to be on one of the major networks in, in February. And so I am going to say a network. Up. You can say it. We'll, we'll release really it in time so people yeah. know what okay. it is. Yeah. So it's a peacock. Yeah. A peacock. And so one of the things is that we um, go into the houses and I just use li literally the app. We look at people's home. Like this one woman for a children, single mom, um, didn't have a date for many years and she wanted desperately a date for Valentine. So we shifted her bedroom based on her birthday she was sleeping the wrong direction so we put her in the right direction we put the right colors based on her birthday the right images and she had four men inviting her out for to valentine and she was so happy but on top of it her money started flowing again you know and she started having a raise and a promotion and it's like even her children did so much better because she was sleeping in a much better place so in the morning she was felt so much happier that all the rest start working, of course. Wow. Well, I'm eager to see the show because I know your stories are going to be amazing of what you go in and you do. And this is all new to me, that 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 whole Bagua map thing. That's all I've been exposed to. So that's why I was so eager to talk with you and eager for everybody that's watching and listening to the show to hear what you're doing. Because you're like the queen of feng shui in America. And I know, and I know you have a huge international following. But I was really eager to find out what are you doing that's different from other people yeah. that are doing feng shui. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. What about people like maybe this mom who is going to be on your TV show? What can people do that don't have extra money to try and help themselves really start to recognize? a difference when they make these changes is uh, you've referred to color a couple of times is color yeah. something I mean paint's not that expensive and we can paint a room a different color pretty easily how does that work well you know I always say what I do is like not something you need a big budget for first of all um, I have people that were down to earth that lived in a tent camp and started using this uh, formula of finding your best directions. And sometimes it's just by, first of all, decluttering the important areas of your uh, personal directions. So if West, for example, is your health direction and you're suffering with, with your health, well, declutter the West because that will be important for you. So that's first thing. You don't need to buy anything for that. The second thing is, you know, you start looking at what can I place there that I already have. Perhaps you have some books on health, yeah? So perhaps you have your vitamin supplements that you can put there. Perhaps you have a yoga mat. Like always first look at what you already have. And then sometimes I say to people, get um, a little affirmation card, you know, put your affirmations up and put that in the right direction. Yeah, I sometimes just use post-it notes, literally. I write something up and put it there, right? Until I have something that is better. If I need a fountain, I just put a fountain on a post-it note and put it in the right direction. And then literally the fountain will come, right? It's just like you already start putting things out. But of course, colors are very easy to work with. And so, you know, there are certain things that, for example, for success, uh, I have this royal blue on right now. So royal blue is a color of success. So if you find like a candle in that color or you have a vase in that color, 
you can put it always in your success direction. It is one of what we call the quantum colors that work for everyone. You have pink on, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Right? So pink is one of the colors of, of romance. And so people can then, you know, perhaps they have a rose heart or they can print something out in that color or you, you just place, you know, creative uh, energy there and you put it in your romance or relationship direction. So, or you put that on your bed. Perhaps you find um, you have some rose pillow or you can find some cheap pillowcases that you put your old pillows in. So you put some of that pink on there. So it's all about adding the color because colors are frequencies and vibrations. And so um, we work a lot with colors and there are 24 quantum colors that uh, work for everyone. So where we place them, we can really enhance the energy. Well, and since our thoughts create our reality, energy is energy. If you're thinking about love, whether you have love or not, that's what's going to be attracted. Is that the basic essence of, of trying to attract the energy and utilizing that, you know, you draw a heart and you put it on a post-it note on your bed or something like what you were talking about just a minute ago. Does that all play in together? I would think it does. Yeah. It does because, you know, like I said, your home is the missing link for most people. So, you know, they have, you know, really great thoughts and they, they want do affirmations. But, you know, we do that, I don't know, five, ten minutes a day. We're not so concentrated on it. But if your home can concentrate with you together on a subconscious level, then you know, your mindset will be much easier to get focused. So... It's just like I say to people, like your home is creating a story and you need to make sure that story is aligned with your mind and your heart and what you desire in life. If it's telling a different story, I'm telling you, your home will win because it's bigger. It's always there. The message is constant. And so if you have a wrong message around you, that message will definitely um, really, you know, block your mindset because literally your mindset you don't do it all the time you don't have always a discipline to always think a certain thought your home has a discipline because it's there all the time and that's something that we can do even if we're living in a small apartment that Correct. we don't really have control let's say they won't let them paint the walls or they won't let them Correct. change out things we can use those little fixes i'm gonna call them whatever you call them what do you call them what yeah do fixes well we we would say activations activate we use we activate it and you know i started in a small studio right um using this when i was you know uh very young and um and first a bedroom then the studio like when i was living by myself now i live in a, a huge mansion in bel-air but the whole point is sometimes I couldn't change it, but then I found fabric and I would thumbnails, I will put it against the wall to create some of the color, right? Uh, so it's all about being creative, you know? And that is something that um, if you know the directions that are important for you, you start with that, yeah? You start with your success direction, declutter it, put some things that everybody has a book on success or on money or books that are about leadership. I don't know what it is. Or you work in a certain company and you can print out a logo and you put it there. Or you have like a your journal which you write down all your your goals. You put it in your success direction. Or you have a vision board. Put it in your success direction. So we always have some things around us that we can place it there. And it's like, uh, you know, I remember, remember this one client and he um, asked us, "Can I live in a tent, what can I do? And I said, do you have post-it notes? Okay, write down with a post-it note, put it on your tent, whatever you want. And then three years later, he was having a job, has a relationship, has his own apartment. And now he goes back into the tent camp to his friends and teaches them the same method. So don't tell me you can't do it if somebody with nothing in the tent can do it with post-it notes. Right. Oh, fabulous. All right, let's back up a little bit. You, you've told us that you were born and raised in Belgium. What caused you to move to America, first of all? And was that free will? Was that your destiny? Was it both? Is there a difference? Well, good question. So, you know, I was already teaching in uh, Belgium and in surrounding countries. And, um, but, you know, I have uh, this big uh, 
mission. So when I was 15, I had a near-death experience. And when I was on the other side, I was giving the message that I was here to enlighten more than 500 million people. So, you know, big order. (laughs) It's a big order, right? Well, you know, I, yes, you know, I've been in the secret. And so the secret has been watched and listened to by more than 500 million people. So it said, I got that one, right? But um, at that time, of course, I had no idea what that meant. And I would say uh, right now, I would start a TikTok account if I would have been 15 now, (laughs) right? But um, so I started trying to make a difference and I became a lawyer, actually. I thought if I would work with the United Nations or governments and I became an international lawyer. Um, But after five years doing that and I already was meditating, I already knew a lot of this information, I started a spiritual center. And I started teaching meditation, enlightenment, and also working with feng shui. But, you know, after a, a good eight years, I thought, like, I would never reach the millions of people if I stay in Belgium, because Belgium is only 10 million people, right? So I'm not going to reach that. So I started uh, going back and forth to America, I started having more and more students and clients in America. And then one day, I woke up with a very intense voice in my head, you need to move here in three weeks. And so I called my husband and I said, we're moving, it's time now. So we moved to America three weeks later. And then within a month, I was attracting clients that ultimately people that were like John Gray, uh, Marcia Shaimov, um, Jack Canfield, Marion Williamson. So all these great luminaries started coming my way and that led me to be part of the secret. So I, I feel like it was it was destiny probably, right? But also there was surrender to that destiny. So when I get the messages and like after 10 years living here, I got, I needed to go to America, back from America to Europe, and I needed to open up East Europe. And so for several years, I worked in all East Europe and Russia to spread this work. And then recently the message was back, come back to America. So I just always follow the voice that was guiding me, my sole purpose. Yeah. When you were told you need to go to America, were you told you need to go to L.A. this last time? Or how did you discern where was going to be the best place for you to go? Well, you know, when I I was in San Francisco teaching the first time, and um, so I figured out I would need to come to San Francisco. But this time I knew exactly I wanted to come back to L.A. I had lived in L.A. Uh, before. So um, after I moved from San Francisco to L.A. the first time, my daughter goes to UCLA, so it's easy to come to to LA for me. Yeah. Right, right. All right. So you can't leave us hanging about your near death experience. Tell us about that. Well, you know, it's just really interesting. I was uh, driving home from school with my bike because everybody in Belgium drives bikes, and so I was very close to home. But um, a, a truck hit me, and. Um, you know, I had an accident. They literally declared me dead, so they already put a fabric over me. And then God and a neighbor saw it and ran to my mother. My mother came to the the location of the accident, started really screaming and yelling to tr- for them to try to revive me. And so I was in the ambulance when I was hovering over my body, seeing my mom in the ambulance, thinking like, what is that? Right? My mom is here? Like that didn't make sense to me. And I saw the ambulance guy that I thought was so cute. I just, you know, later on described my mom. He had blonde hair, curly hair, blue eyes. My God, that was the the most beautiful guy I've ever seen. And so, but I left my body even further. And I just went in front of, I was like in a body of light. And there were like other, I, I would say beings of light. You call them masters or angels. I will leave that in the middle. And so, and this one voice said, you need to go back. You're here to enlighten more than 500 million people. So I came back a few days later and um, and that has been my purpose. Every morning I wake up with that mantra and I ask every morning to God, to universe, show me how. And apparently feng shui was one of the hows. Yeah, fascinating. I I do the same thing every morning on my morning prayers. God, show me, show me how I can serve today. Same yep. thing. Same thing. Oh, basically. What uh, prompted you to choose feng shui? Were you just led there or it had had you ever heard of it as a 15-year-old? What was that 
that whole journey for you from being a lawyer, international lawyer to feng shui, number one. And number two, I know that you are clairvoyant and I want to hear about that. And you were clairvoyant as a little child. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I want to hear about yeah. that. Well, um, first of all, you know, when I was seven, I met my spiritual master. So it's an ascended master, St. Jimmy that came to see me and he started teaching me meditations. And so um, I think, uh, you know, I don't know why he came directly to me. I always think because there was probably nobody else around. So What's I'll, yeah, he known for? He's known for um, the, the violet flame. It's known exactly. for, um, you know, releasing karma, really. Right. And so um, it was very interesting. Um, as a child, I had these conversations and meetings with him in the other realms, probably, right? And uh, But when I was 15, and I after the accident, I was very depressed because I had a lot of learning uh, problems after my accident. And then one day he came by and I asked him, what did I do wrong? And he just said, very funny, bad feng shui, Marie. And I was like, what's that, right? And so um, he explained it to me that the location of where I was sleeping was really bad. I was sleeping on the north side of the house. There was no sunlight. I was very depressed there. So I moved to the west side, which is really a good direction for me. So I uh, attracted, from instead of being bullied at school, I attracted a lot of friends, uh, my first love. So a lot of things started changing when I moved there. And so he told me, later on, I will bring you more information about that. Focus first on your meditation. So he brought me more inside of that. But then he also directed me to become a lawyer. He was very clear I needed to become a lawyer. And um, and that was indeed important because I work with a lot of top celebrities and companies. And so if I would not have that lawyer degree, I don't think that would accept me completely in who I am. And so it's only when I was 30 that he told me that it was time that I need to study about feng shui. But he always told me, like, you need to be very visible and still under the radar. And said feng shui will help you with that because I go mainstream with feng shui. So if I would talk about meditations, people don't always get it, but I speak to people from all religions, from all backgrounds, all political backgrounds, um, all cultures. And so the energy of their home is something they have access to. They are open to it. And of course, then I bring them to a higher frequency and higher realms, you know, as they're going through it. So that's one of the things um, that I've been doing. And it's it's really indicated by him that was my my direction to bring forward. But, you know, as a child, I always saw energy. I saw people's aura field, the chakras. I had no idea what it meant. I thought everybody could see it, to be honest. Um, and I would say things to my parents like, oh, you know, grandfather is dead tomorrow. You better speak nicely to him. Or I would see like when there was something wrong between two people. Like I literally told my mom that my father had an affair. I was five years old, right? And I was like, they're doing things that are not okay, right? So like I just could see their chakras that were like aligned and, and it didn't make sense that, you know, my father and this woman would be so aligned. Um, so my parents were very open to it because um, when I was born, um, my father had a, a clairvoyant priest, a Catholic priest, that was an advisor to many uh, politicians and big people in my country. And so he told my father that I was clairvoyant and that whatever I would say, they had to listen to me. And that it was a gift of God. So I'm very grateful to that priest because otherwise, you know, you never know how people react when I say certain things. So it was like always normal in my for my parents when I would say something, they were like, oh, yeah, okay. So they treated me as very normal about it, what I'm very grateful for. Yeah, absolutely. When you saw your dad and his mistress's chakras aligned, what did that look like? What, explain what that meant, what that means. Well, it... Well, it was like, um, you know, um, tentacles. Yeah, I saw this like the tentacles were like coming together, but I saw the same tentacles with my mom and my dad too, right? So it was like, then it was with my mom and my dad. That made sense. But uh, that was with her and my father. I knew that didn't make sense. I just knew, right? So it was just like the chakras were like 
you know, as tentacles coming together. Right. I call those bioplasmic streamers. And that's how yeah. I connect to my clients remotely is I watch, it looks like a laser beam, Marie, coming from my body, from my sternum, and it hooks in directionally wherever they are. I watch it. It's like I'm watching it go across a map. I watch it go across oceans or or whatever. And, and I call those bioplasmic streamers. What's an energy number? So based on your birthday and your birth uh, date, you have an energetic profile. And we call that profile a number. So you have one to nine. And so based on that number, then it, there's an archetype. So like I'm a connector. So that means I love to connect East and West. I love to connect the dots of different backgrounds and signs holistically and, and signs. I love to connect people, right? So uh, that's kind of who I am. Um, but it also means that there are four directions connected with each number. So the number is actually the basic at the start for your personal feng shui. Okay. Isn't it interesting how numbers are involved in everything? It's it's like the universal language is numbers. I I think of the movie Contact. Did you ever see that with Jodie Foster? I think it was I did, released yeah. in the late 80, early 80s, maybe. And yeah. she's getting, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, she's getting information downloaded and it's all a bunch of numbers. And the numbers turn into a basically an architectural drawing of how to build a ship to travel through the cosmos. I'm going to have a a math professor on this show here soon, and she's using numbers in a different way and connecting it to different things like art to teach math to especially small children because she's found out that it lays different pathways in the brain and helps them understand how numbers are the universal language. So it's interesting that you've tapped into that as well with your methodology. Yeah, and feng shui, feng shui is really mathematical formulas. So if you go deeper into the science behind it, because some people call it an art, I really believe it's a science, a quantum physics science of the environment. And so um, and it's really interesting. I saw that movie, you know, in the 80s, and I thought at that time, I want to work with Judy Foster one day, and she's actually one of my clients. Oh, so I love that. It's, it's quite interesting, right? Um, but yeah, numbers, I mean, I always say God is a mathematician. Ah, because that's the universal way to communicate. Because right. everybody yeah. understands numbers, whether you're using ab- an abacus or uh, whatever. Uh, you know, uh, I remember when the pocket calculators came out or the complex mathematical programs and stuff. And it was just like magic, you know, that you could do that I, stuff in an instant. Okay. Yeah. And there are still people that like to use an abacus. I mean, that's not, that's not un, unheard of. You do a phenomenal job, in my opinion, of combining ancient wisdom and modern day neuroscience. Tell us about that. Well, you know, one of the things, uh, and it's based on the energy that I saw, I always saw that when people um, would be in a different position or they would have different colors, I could really see like their brain waves change. And so um, it's like I could almost like... What's that look like? Well, it's it's like uh, waves, literally like spikes, yeah? So I could like see that like coming out of their head, you know, it's, it's really weird. Um, but... Um, then later on, I found out I was in awakened delta. So after the accident, so I, I stay constantly in awakened delta state. And so what it is, is that, you know, normally in delta state, you're, you're asleep. Yeah. So, and I'm sure you're in awakened delta too, Julie. Otherwise, you would not do this work. So most people have what I would call beta delta, beta state. And beta is when you're concentrated, but there's like, it's like a survival a way of thinking, right? And it's also very connected with your uh, your reptilian brain. So the energy goes to the back, and so these brains are really showing up in the back of the uh, the the head. And then when people are uh, more into, I would say, uh, alpha state, then the energy comes really here at the front of the frontal cortex. I see these waves coming out here. And so I saw that people, when they're, for example, sitting with their back to the door, that all the spikes come here, all the waves come here. And so then they are more in survival mode, more in worries, more in fears, because they stay in the reptilian consciousness. 
And so they are surviving. And then when people turn their desk around, for example, they see the door, like all the energy starts opening up here at the third eye, but it's also more than third eyes. Of course, the um, the hippopotamus that starts working better. And so they go into alpha state. And so when we're in alpha state, we see opportunities, we see are creative, we're optimistic, we see the future, we, we have solutions in front of us. So I start seeing that, you know, with people, not just on the chakras, I start seeing that. And then we did tests, you know, with encephalograms. And we saw that indeed, if people, for example, face a good direction, so one of their four directions, immediately the alpha wave starts spiking within a few seconds. And then later on, I start using muscle testing to show people how to feel it because I cannot do the encephalograms all the time on the body. That would be too difficult. But, you know, if they're then, um, for example, would face a good direction, their muscle testing is strong. So when you push on the arm and when they are facing the wrong direction, then the encephalograms show that they were faster going into uh, beta brainwaves and that literally their muscle testing would be weak. So when I'm uh, working with people, I use muscle testing because I cannot, you know, put an encephalogram on people's head all the time. So, but that's kind of, I saw it first and we tested it, you know, more scientifically. And then, you know, at certain places when all the directions are activated and your house is in a good function, you go very easy in theta brainwaves. What is the healing frequencies? So people heal faster. I right? saw so a lot of... Um, healers and coaches by having their home um, in a stronger feng shui they have more effect and more impact with their work how about it pay attention to that and i and i work with people every every work day clients all over and it's interesting to me that you're talking about those energy frequencies coming out of the head because oftentimes i'll see it's like a fog in front of the frontal lobes and I yeah. can always tell if they're on medication, whether it be prescription or recreational drugs, because it's like if we dip a Q-tip in baby oil, there's this clear oily ring around the perimeter of that. And so I'll say, do you experience brain fog? And they'll say, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And I'll say, OK, what medications are you on? You know, what are you doing? And, and then I can watch it get removed in the healing, but I'm going to pay attention from what you just taught me to pay attention to what happens after that. Does that open up the, you know, the energy that's coming out in the creative areas and things like that? that I'm going to add that to my scans. That's going to be well, really interesting. What do you, do you and it, that? it is. Yeah, do you I see like that. when there's brain fog in front of the frontal lobes. Yeah. Well, it's like I, I see it more in the etheric field. It's like I yeah. turn into an etheric field and there's like a cloud. That's me. what it looks like. Yeah. yeah. It it's is like kind of grayish. Yeah. Yeah. It is grayish. Yeah. It's a grayish cloud. And so normally it should be like blue white, right. where the energy should be blue white. And so like bluish white energy. And so, you know, when I see people having this cloud, I already know. Um, because that's my intuitive side from looking at the house. I'm, I'm sure they're sleeping the wrong direction. Mm. Yeah. And because they, when they wake up, they will not have the access to that third eye. And so um, it could be that they're sleeping on, uh, you know, negative vortex or, uh, you know, uh, underground water. And I see sometimes I see the, the lines of that underground water. It cannot just be here. It can be literally like a blue, uh, uh, instead of the blue white, it's like a gray line that is over their body. And I'm like, oh, you have problems there and there. And I said, okay, I, because of course I focus on the, not on, on, on the healing aspect like you do, but I look at the healing of the home, right? Mm -hmm. And then we put specific sticks out and like acupuncture sticks for the home. We put it in there and literally within uh, 24 hours, that is cleared, yeah? And then it starts showing up again as a blue-white energy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, and that would make sense because the home, back to the mold example, is affecting that. What I see a correlation a lot of the time when when I see that in somebody that, that has medical issues is not only is there a hormone imbalance, there's a malabsorption issue, there's all these other issues. And yeah. I've never thought about it stemming from the home before, but that makes yes. total sense for me. 
changing directions. I have so many questions for you, so little time. You've been knighted a dame. Tell us about that. So, you know, there are um, several organizations beyond uh, the, the royal uh, lineage that can, um, you know, knight people a dame. So there's the oldest organization and it's uh, uh, St. John uh, Knights um, from Malta that is actually um, exists for more than a thousand years, right? That just really um, people that have brought a difference into the world have been creating a lot of charity uh, support. Um, I mean, there are you know Nobel Prize winners, there are sometimes statesmen. Um, and so they they look for people and, and they, they follow their career for a while. And then they invite you um, to become a dame or a knight. And so it's an official title, I'm a dame. And so it's really beautiful. It's like you're through an old ceremony, you get knighted with the, the oil and you get knighted with the, um, um, the sword. And so it's, it's an old tradition and people that are knighted and they feel like even more the stronger uh, purpose to make a big difference in the world. So it, it's, it's really, it's like an honor, but at the same time, it's, it's almost like a request to do more. Yeah. And I'm familiar with that order. And when I was watching King Charles get whatever, you know, what do they call it? When he, when he was coronated, I guess. Yeah. When, coronated, when they yeah. did that and the robes and the whole thing that he had on, did you wear those robes like that? Um, well, it, it's another similar kind of robe, but it's yeah. similar. Yeah. That yeah. you have to put on for that day. Um, you know, and a lot of royal families are part of the Knights of uh, St. John, but it's a hospital night. So they were actually, as you had the Templar Knights, you had the hospital Knights. So they were the ones that created hospitals all over Europe to support the wounded ones. So from there, it's still the tradition that the people that are in there are, and they, they you know, we have a special Malta cross that we wear in certain occasions. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a huge honor to be part of it. It's a big deal because my whole body is vibrating with you talking about it. I have total body goosebumps. So there's definitely some serious mojo going on with that. You talk about the three parts of the law of attraction. Please talk to us about those and what are they and how do they work? Well, we actually talked about it when I talked about there's a spiritual luck the, or the heavenly luck, the human luck, and it's the uh, earth luck. So when we're connecting with our soul um, and we are doing our prayers and we're doing our meditations and we're connecting with God, that is actually how we create spiritual luck. Um, and, and that depends on where you're from, right? It's depending on your spiritual beliefs, on religions. Um, but it's actually your soul purpose is connected with that part. And then, of course, the self-help and the self-development uh, world is focusing more on that second part about the human luck finding your full human potential to work with your mindset, to be grateful to, to how to deal with your emotional being, um, you know, how to also take actions, right? And to do it always from a perspective of doing good for yourself and doing good for others. That's your second part. And I would say since the seventies, that human luck has been really, um, you know, really enhanced and been activated in the Western world where the spiritual luck has been around for thousands of years in all religions and all backgrounds. But I would say the human luck are really focusing on getting the mindset right. That's where in The Secret, you know, the, the movie and the book, they were focused on the most. And it was the only one that was talking about the, the environmental luck. Yeah. And so how feng shui and dowsing and space clearing is really affecting um, how you feel in your space. And I always say this is the foundation. And a lot of people are sometimes, they have all these great changes they're making, right? Uh, if it's through healing, if it's through changing their mindset, if it's through spiritual work, they literally sometimes cannot integrate it or they cannot activate it or they cannot implement it because their home is, is not aligned with what they really want. And so once you add that missing link to it, it's like you feel like all the healing goes easier, all the 
changes you make go easier. So I would say you can hit to the top of the mountain with the willpower, but it will be with a lot of effort. So if you have the wind behind you, that means your home is aligned, then literally you are, um, I would say you have the wind with you, so you will have more ease, more effortless energy to get to the top of the mountain. So think about what you did with your mother's China, you would still have found a way to solve it and, and get the abundance, but it that was blocking you somehow, so it creates more effort. So I always say, you know, it's all about ease and effortless. And if I look at my life and the things I have created, you know, a lot of people think I work hard. No, I do work hard, but I have so much wind behind me. Mm-hmm. You talked to Marie about forgiveness and changing one's mindset as far as grudges and and being grateful and things like that. Can you address that a little bit for us, please? Yeah. So for me, forgiveness is has been really crucial in my life personally. So, you know, I come from my father, um, you know, was somebody who had a post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome from World War II was very aggressive, both physically and emotionally and mentally. And um, so for me, I really knew that if I wanted to really get to another level in myself, I had to be able to forgive him and to forgive myself for holding on to it. So when my father had stage uh, four cancer when I was 25, I just finished college and I had to take care for six months of him. He didn't want to go to a hospital. So I was uh, doing all the palliative um, um, care with my mother for him. And um, what happened is like, I really felt I needed to forgive him. So the a week before he died, he thought I was the priest. And so he told all the stories of his life, like all the things he did wrong. And there was a lot that, you know, um, my father um, abused women. My father uh, killed some people. So he had held on to a lot of that. You can imagine as a medical intuitive that, you know, that of course created a lot of the issues from his cancer. And so, and he asked me for forgiveness. So I gave him forgiveness as like the priest, but I was not ready to give him forgiveness as his daughter. And so the, the last week of his life, I really struggled, but I decided that I, if I wanted to really get into my soul purpose, I had to forgive my father, the man I hated the most in my life. And so the night before he died, I completely forgave him. And I forgave him in name of all the women and all the people that um, he ever, you know, abused and, and treated wrong. And so the, the release on his body, it was like from somebody who suffered like crazy, suddenly the peace that came into his body was so life-shifting and the peace that came in my body and in my mind, in my heart. And I always say without that piece of forgiveness, I would not have reached my enlightenment experience a few years later. I would not become the teacher and have all this compassion in my life and in my heart to help people because forgiveness was a crucial part for it. And I know by doing the work with the violent flame that I did since I was seven, you know, with St. Germain, releasing all my karma, releasing as much as I could, all the grudges, I would probably not have been able to do that either. Wow. A couple more questions as we're winding down. You talk about brain energy versus heart energy and how heart energy is more powerful. Can you tell us your thoughts about that, yeah. please? Well, you know, um, we have our brains, the left and the right brain, but we also have our third brain, right? And our third brain is the heart intelligence. And so now since the Heart Math Ed Institute, for example, they have done a lot of research lately that, you know, uh, we have an intelligence in our heart. And that's actually what I believe is our soul intelligence, right? Our, um, our brain intelligence is connected with our personality and what we do and it's needed for our body to function, our mind to function, but our soul is directly connected with our heart. And so when people want to really connect with their soul purpose, they need to have an open heart. They need to um, really allow that heart intelligence to start. And one of the things I've seen is that feng shui is 
uh, one of the ways to open up that heart intelligence. And we all know that when we go somewhere and we feel at home, right? And we go to a place and we're like, ah, oh, I feel at home. And I always say, well, in the word home is the word own, right? Is the word peace and balance. And so when you go to a place where you feel that oh, energy, that own vibration, it's because your heart is vibrating there on that peaceful vibration of the universe. And so we come to a place where we don't feel that ah, relaxation and we go easy back into that mind that is busy and is focused on different levels. But I do believe when your home is feng shui, your heart intelligence can work better. Okay. One last question. Why do we incarnate? Oh, okay. So we incarnate to really um, become that spiritual self. You know, um, I do believe we have uh, gotten into the involution. We came from spirit back into matter. And now we are going from matter back into spirit. And so each time we reincarnate, we choose this way to learn some life lessons, some to really found our soul purpose. And I do believe that when you really have found your soul purpose, that you probably will not reincarnate again because, you know, you have really gotten the spirit into the matter. You brought your spirit into matter. And so, um, yeah, it is, it's a journey and we can't do it all in one lifetime. That is just not possible, even if you live a long lifetime. Um, and each lifetime, I think you, you look at different perspectives of how to really incarnate that light, that spirit that you are. Great answer. How can people learn more about you and your work? Well, they can go first of all to marydiamond.com. That is uh, the easiest access. They can go also download the free Mary Diamond app. They just put on the app stores Mary Diamond. Then there's the book that just came out from Shreya Life from Hay House in good bookstores and in uh, Amazon. And uh, yeah, I would say Instagram, they can find me there, Mary Diamond Official, YouTube channel. So there's a lot of free information for people to start with. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, support people with enlightening themselves by enlightening their home. And when does your new TV show start on the Peacock Network? Well, we will know this week, but probably February. In February. All right, you guys. Well, my goodness, what a wonderful conversation. I learned a lot. I know everybody listening learned a lot too. All of you that are listening, please like, subscribe, share this conversation with your family and friends because there are so many golden nuggets of information here that can be useful to anybody that watches or listens to this. So in the meantime, sending you lots of love from Sweet Home, Alabama, Mwah! and from California too, where Marie is. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Julie on Instagram and YouTube at Ask Julie Ryan. And like her on Facebook at Ask Julie Ryan. To schedule an appointment or submit a question, please visit AskJulieRyan.com. This show is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be medical, psychological, financial, or legal advice. Please contact a licensed professional. The Ask Julie Ryan Show, Julie Ryan and all parties involved in producing, recording, and distributing it assume no responsibility for listeners' actions based on any information heard on this or any Ask Julie Ryan shows or podcasts.